Hello. Hello. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, depending on where you are around the world. Uh, I hope we have an uh, audience from all over the place. Uh, I welcome you to this very, very special uh, seminar in the series of virtual ICM seminars in computer and computational science. My name is Marek Michalewicz. Uh, I'm the director of the uh, Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling, University of Warsaw. Uh, we started a series of uh, seminars uh, right after our Supercomputing Frontiers Europe conference, which for the first time, it was the sixth edition, for the first time it took place in virtual space uh, because of uh, COVID-19. And since uh, it turned out to be very sort of uh, well received, with instead of 200 people, we had close to 1,000 participants from 67 countries. Uh, we decided to continue with the weekly seminars, especially if, if when when uh, people became isolated and locked down and at home. So uh, we thought that that would be a good idea, and I hope it is. And uh, I'm I'm extremely happy that that uh, uh, Dr. Wolfram accepted our invitation. Uh, this will be the it, it is his tenth uh, seminar. We'll uh, stop. Uh, with this and uh, take a break over the summer. We'll uh, most probably return to, to our seminars after this the summer. But uh, let me first acknowledge a few of our sponsors, media sponsors who help us reach the, the, to a larger audience. It's Datanami, HPC Wire, Enterprise AI, ITWIS, Sztuczna Intelligencia, and Computer World. Next week, although it's still June, we won't be running a seminar because uh, it's a week devoted to International Supercomputing Conference, the largest e uh, such event in Europe. Again, this year it will be a virtual event and free event, so I encourage all of you who are interested in supercomputing and computational science to attend. Uh, during the summer, we'll be running workshops for students. So if there are students uh, in the audience, uh, please consider participating. The information will be on our uh, website. Uh, most of the uh, topics will be related to uh, graph theory, uh, graph computations, and AI. Uh, please also uh, check our web website where we have uh, released uh, keynotes from the first day of our first, second, and third day of our uh, supercomputing conference. and. Uh, uh, these are fascinating topics. Uh, I'm sure that you will find them very, very interesting and, and, and uh, sort of uh, will induce your thinking. Uh, all of the previous lectures uh, can also be found on our website. And uh, I don't want to take more of the time. Uh, if Dr. Wolfram, please forgive me. I won't be introducing you and give me your background because I believe everybody knows your background. Okay. All right. Great. Well, Glad to be with everybody today. I realize in these virtual times, uh, I was thinking, when was I last in Warsaw? And I think the answer is 1980. Um, and actually, that was a time in my life when I was energetically doing particle physics um, and uh, uh, was kind of the end of a period of time when I was very productively working on quantum field theory and uh, cosmology and so on was kind of during a, a golden age of those fields. Um, and uh, so back in 1980, I was talking about physics. Well, uh, 40 years has gone by since then, and I've done a lot of other things since then. But actually, curiously, in the last uh, six months, I have come back to physics. And the really remarkable thing is that the things that we've done in physics recently uh, that are much more ambitious than things that I thought about doing 40 years ago, turn out to be deeply related to questions in computation. And in fact, what, what's happened is uh, in the last six months, kind of gone off in a direction of something I've thought about for about 30 years, of finding a way to understand the fundamental theory of physics, to sort of go below the last 100 years of thinking from general relativity and quantum field theory and find sort of the low level machine code of the universe. And the amazing thing is that it looks like it's working. It looks like we're actually figuring it out. 
and it looks like we're we're understanding sort of what's underneath physics. But what's underneath physics is something deeply computational. And the thing that's really interesting to me just in the last few weeks that we've been realizing is the amazing connections between thinking about distributed computing and thinking about physics. In fact, sort of the problems of distributed computing turn out to be, in some sense, the same as the problems of physics. And so what we'll be talking about, so I thought I would talk a little bit today about, about that connection, that sort of surprising emergence there. Um, and uh, I'll talk a bit about kind of how I got to this point and kind of the, the stack of science and technology that lets us talk about these kinds of things. Um, it's kind of ironic. Let me give you an example. Uh, back in, in 1980, I was working on my, my first uh, computer language, a thing called SMP, which was a forerunner of Mathematica, which is now uh, our full-scale computational language, the Wolfram language. Um, the, uh, back at that time, I was thinking about physics, and I was thinking about language design. And in language design, for example, I was trying to work out how do you control recursion? So, you know, you're computing some recursive function and let's say a Fibonacci function or something, and you have this whole tree of recursions that can happen. And there's a question, do you do some depth first recursion kind of crawling down one side of the tree and then you come back up? Or do you have some kind of breadth first recursion? How do you do this? And I, I tried to figure out how to parameterize that in the context of a computer language. And uh, I think I kind of failed. I mean, I put things into that language. I don't think anybody understood them, including perhaps me. But the funny thing was, at the same time, I was thinking about uh, gauge theories in physics and local gauge invariants and uh, the, the kind of phenomenon of local gauge invariants that leads to things like the standard model of particle physics and so on. And I, you know, I thought of these things as just utterly unconnected kinds of intellectual directions. OK, the ultimate irony is that in the end, I think recursion control and local gauge invariants are, in some sense, the same thing. And I'll try to explain what I mean by that. And I think some of the things we're going to be talking about are things like thinking about uh, distributed computing as a sort of a, uh, a something where you're, you're talking about uh, trying to understand the distributed computation in much the same way as you try to understand space time and the physical world. And I think something that uh, we will be talking about in the future, we're not kind of ready yet for this, is a concept of sort of programming in a certain reference frame in the same sense that we think about experiencing the physical world in a certain reference frame. I think that will be a coming direction in terms of, of how that kind of thing works. So let me show you, just to begin with, let me, let me just give you a sketch of how, um, uh, um, of how our physics project works. And let me see if I can share my screen here. OK, so this is our physics project homepage. Um, and uh, uh, everything about this project is being done sort of in an open way. So for example, we're live streaming our working meetings about the project. And for example, all of the code and software that we're using for, for simulating and studying it, it's, it's all Wolfram language code, and it's all available from this website. Um, and you can run it in any, in any Wolfram language instance, either on a desktop or in the cloud. Um, all right, let me, let me tell you a little bit about the physics of this. And then I want to segue to talking about um, talking about kind of the 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 the, comp the way we've got to this computationally, and a little bit about how it relates to the general question of the role of computation in the world today, and kind of computation as a paradigm for thinking about everything. It's kind of a uh, it's kind of a a uh, sort of this is in a sense I think a, a killer app for for the computational paradigm that we can understand sort of the low level machine code of the universe that way, um, but. I think that sort of for, for any field X, whether it's you know archaeology or zoology, there's kind of an emerging idea of computational X. And I've spent many years sort of building the tools to enable computational X. This is a particular killer app that happens to have uh, a lot to say, I think, about distributed computing. So I thought I would concentrate particularly on that today, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the other computational Xs as well. All right, let's talk about the physics project. So. Question is, what's the universe made of? Well, we have two dominant theories, quantum field theory, general relativity. They're both about 100 years old. Um, general relativity talks about gravity and the large scale structure of space time. Quantum field theory talks about particles and the small scale structure of things. Um, the, uh, the question is, uh, what might be underneath all of that stuff? 
And one of the things I guess I can talk about. Well, let, let me, uh, yeah, let me let me um, uh, explain a little bit of. Um, so what, one of the things that sort of launched this project was the realization that I had back in the 1980s, actually, um, about something very surprising about modeling and computation. So for about the last 300 years, kind of the dominant form of modeling in, in science has been use mathematical equations. That was kind of the idea from Newton and Galileo and people like that. And that worked really well for lots of purposes. But back in uh, around the time when I last visited uh, Poland, actually, um, was um, I was kind of starting to think about um, if we are going to make models for things in the world for which we don't yet have mathematical equations, how should we make those models? And what I realized is that mathematical equations are a very specific approach to modeling. But if you just say there are rules that govern the operation of a system, there are more general kinds of rules that you can talk about that aren't necessarily mathematical equations. And in these times, we have kind of a medium for talking about these things and its computation. And so what I got into was the question of, OK, so if we're going to make uh, rules that um, describe how systems work, uh, what might the rules for nature be like? Um, and uh, when we typically, when we write programs, we construct long, complicated, specific programs for the particular purposes we want. But in nature, we might ask, what programs might nature be running to do the things it does? So I got very interested in a very simple class of programs, sort of a minimal set of programs uh, that are called cellular automata. And let me try and show you a little bit about how those work. So I'll just use open language here um, to do that. So let me um, let me show you this. This is uh, these are rules for a cellular automaton. So the way the thing is set up, it's just a, it's a very minimal. Think of it as a sort of most minimal distributed program. It's a, a line of cells, each black or white, um, and uh, at each step, the color of a cell is determined by the color of the cell above it and to its left and right. Okay, so that's the way it works. So now we can say, okay, let's um, let's go ahead and. Uh, uh, and work out what this does. Let's say take 30 steps. So let me just uh, show it with a, a mesh here. Oops, what I wanted to do, I wanted to uh, make that. Um, okay, so here I'm, I'm just running this particular distributed program, my minimal distributed program that says, uh, uh, starting off with one black cell here, just follow this rule, okay? So you might say, well, the rule is simple, so it's not surprising that what it does is something very simple. Let's try a different rule. Let's try this rule here. Uh, we can say, what, does, what, is, what is that rule doing? It's doing this. Let me try running this for a few more steps. Let's say 300 steps. Let's not draw the mesh because we won't see anything if we do that. OK, so if we run that for 300 steps, we get this, um, uh, this nested pattern. We still might say, OK, you know, it's a nested, very intricate pattern, but nevertheless, it is, in some sense, showing the simplicity of the underlying rule by virtue of its regularity. OK, so let's now do, so this is something I did back um, in the 1980s, not, um, uh, not with the tools I have today. Let's ask the question, if we just look at all possible rules of this kind, there are 256 rules of this particular kind, what do all these rules do? So this is kind of like, um, let's just do the computer experiment. It's kind of an experimental mathematics. Let's just do the computer experiment and, and answer the question, what do these things do? And we can have the hypothesis that, oh, they're all just going to do simple things because the rule is so simple. But let's actually try it and see what happens. OK, so let's just run this. Let's just do the first 64 of them. OK, so each one of these pictures corresponds to starting with one black cell and running a different rule. So we see a lot of them, very simple behavior, just a, a stripe, a dot, whatever. Some of them make these nested patterns and so on. OK, we keep going. And then we have a big surprise. And this is kind of like, it's like doing natural science, um, but it's in the computational universe instead of the, uh, uh, the natural universe, so to speak. In the computational universe, we're kind of pointing a telescope into the computational universe and seeing what's out there. And this is sort of a super surprising thing that's out there. This is, uh, we can kind of count these rules by just uh, looking at the binary decomposition of the, of the program, so to speak. And this is rule 30 in that, uh, in that way of setting things up. And this is what it does. So we're starting off from just one black cell here, and we're seeing this is the behavior we get. OK, let, let's run it for a bit longer. Let's say we have rule 30 here. Um, let's run it, let's say, 300 steps. OK, isn't this amazingly surprising? This is you know, the rule. Here, I'll show you what rule 30 is. 
It's just this thing here, very simple rule. You can write it in Boolean form. It's just an XOR and an OR combined together. You can do it in lots of ways. This is, in a sense, as I say, sort of a minimal piece of distributed computing. We started off from one black dot at the top, and this is the behavior we get. So for me, this was kind of an intuition-breaking discovery because I thought simple rules, always simple behavior. That's kind of what we're used to from kind of doing engineering. If we want to make something complicated, we have to go to lots of engineering effort to do that, so to speak. But this is a case where just sampling out in the computational universe of all possible rules, rule 30 gives us this behavior, remarkably complicated behavior. So at first, when I first saw this, I thought, gosh, you know, there's some regularity on the left here. We've got to find some way. There's some mathematics or, or, or cryptography or something that we can use to kind of crack this pattern, to find out that even given the pattern, we could tell that it was simple. But it turns out it doesn't seem to be true. Uh, I just put up actually recently some sort of prizes for proving anything about things like the center column of, um, uh, of the behavior of Rule 30. But so far as we can tell, the center column of Rule 30 is, in some sense, perfectly random in the sense that even though there's a very simple rule, it's kind of like digits of pi. There's, a, there's an algorithm for computing it, but once you've got it, any sort of test of randomness that you run seems to say, oh, it's random. And that's something that, um, uh, and, and it's, it's sort of interesting to see this as a way of kind of mining the computational universe of possible programs. If you want to find a pseudo-random generator that's really good, uh, this is, you can just sort of go and look at all these possible programs, and, and here there's one that, and we've used this as a pseudo-random generator for a long time. It's actually the only sort of surviving pseudo-random generator from, from 30 or 40 years ago uh, that's still, still left standing and, and wasn't sort of broken as a, as a cryptographic kind of thing. Um, but it's sort of remarkable that from such a simple rule, this is kind of the big discovery of the computational universe, that even from very simple rules in the computational universe, it's possible to get very complicated behavior. Now, we can say a lot of things about this behavior. So, for example, one thing we might ask, and it's a, it's a fundamental phenomenon, is if we say, can we predict what's going to happen, let's say, a million steps in the future here? Well, one way we can figure out what's going to happen is just run it for a million steps and see what hap happens. But kind of one of the things we've been taught from sort of traditional uh, mathematical equations-based science is, no, the real win is when you can jump ahead when you can computationally reduce the behavior of the system and you can say, I don't have to follow all those million orbits of the idealized Earth around an idealized sun. I can just plug a number into a formula and work out where the Earth will be a million years from now. And so the question is, can you computationally reduce the behavior of a system like this? And the answer seems to be no. This is a system where uh, the only way you can find out what it's going to do is just to run it and see what happens. So this is related to a thing I call the principle of computational equivalence. There's sort of a question of if you think about this thing as a computer, as something which is taking its input and computing output, how sophisticated a computation is this? And the thing that I sort of, sort of a, a, a big principle that I discovered a long time ago now is this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence, that, that it is the case that even though the rules for a system may be very simple, the computation that it can do is just the same of just the same sophistication as any other system. So for example, here's an example of one. This is uh, rule 110. Let me run it for lots more steps, a thousand steps, for example. This one happens to grow only on the left. Start off from one black cell. See what it's doing here. It's doing all kinds of complicated things. Actually, if we start this off, let me start this off from a, a um, uh, let me make another, another one of these. Let me, let me just start this off from a random initial condition. Um, and this is, again, think of it as a, as a very simple distributed computing system. Let's just start it off from a random integer. Let's say we go, um, oh, I don't know, let's, let's go 1,000 steps. So go 1,000 things across. OK, so this is now uh, rule 110, another cellular automaton. I can show you its rule up here. Um, let's do that here. Um, uh, OK, very simple rule. Uh, this is its behavior. So what you see is it produces a bunch of these kind of structures, and you might say, well, what's the interaction between these structures? It looks a little bit like kind of logic gates or, you know, signals propagating down wires and so on. Of course, remember, all that's being made just by this very simple rule. But anyway, so we're, we're kind of, uh, it's doing all these interactions. It looks like it's almost doing some kind of, uh, almost doing some kind of logic or something. Well, it turns out with great effort, one can show that, yes, indeed, this particular system is a universal computer. It is possible to set up the initial conditions for this so that it can compute anything that can be computed. 
So this is part of the sort of evidence for the principle of computational equivalence, that even in a system kind of plucked from the computational universe, a system as simple as this, it's possible to get computation that is as sophisticated as any universal computer. And, and I've kind of gone on a hunt these years um, for uh, examples of this. For example, I'll show you one thing. Uh, let me just pull that up. Um, so this is uh, for Turing machines. Turing machines sort of a famous model of, uh, of computation that people are no doubt familiar with. Um, this is a particular concrete Turing machine, which just has um, uh, two states and three colors. And uh, this is the simplest Turing machine that could conceivably be universal. And uh, uh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, um, we put up this kind of prize for somebody to prove or disprove that it's universal. And a young chap in England proved that indeed this, this Turing machine is universal. So it is the, the simplest conceivable universal Turing machine, and it is universal. And that's another piece of evidence for this principle of computational equivalence, that as soon as the behavior of a system is not obviously simple, it will turn out to be sort of as complicated as anything. And that means, among other things, that when we as, as humans or mathematicians or something are trying to predict the behavior of the system, we're in the sort of competition. It's doing a computation. We're doing a computation to predict it. Who's going to win, so to speak? And the whole point of the principle of computational equivalence is uh, we can't systematically win. And that's what leads to computational irreducibility. That's what leads to the conclusion that um, uh, we can't jump ahead of the system. We are stuck sort of at the same level of computational sophistication as the system. So for example, if we ask in the case of this rule 110 system starting from a single black cell, what's it going to do in the end? Well, it's hard to tell. It's got these structures. It's like, are these structures going to die out? Are they going to, um, you know, what are they going to do? Well, let me try running it. Let's try running it for 3,000 steps. Um, so it turns out if we go long enough, we will eventually see that those structures die out. But it takes uh, nearly 3,000 steps to do that. And actually, there's no upper bound on how many steps it might take to figure out what's going on. So if we simply ask, you know, does this halt or not? The answer is it's going to be undecidable whether it halts. And so kind of the phenomenon of undecidability that was discovered by Gödel in 1931 and so on in the context of mathematics um, was is something which is not sort of a an obscure thing. It's something which is actually something that we see all over the place because of this principle of computational equivalence, because of computational irreducibility. And it's a it's an important sort of force in many of the kinds of things we do. I mean, it's worth remembering what what Gödel did was essentially to show that something like the statement this statement is unprovable can be compiled into a statement about arithmetic. And what we're showing here is that any computation can be compiled into something that runs according to this very simple rule here. Okay, so the, the main conclusion of this, uh, and so for example, when you think about practical computing, you know, simulation is a, is a kind of a good scheme for doing things. This is showing simulation is not just convenient, it's fundamentally necessary because computational irreducibility says the only way you can find out what one of these systems is going to do is by doing explicit simulation. So, this, um, uh, so, so th that's, um, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, the, uh, uh, so that, that's kind of a, a big conclusion from sort of studying the computational universe. But the, the main thing, uh, so, so by the way, when we think about making models of things in the world, I mean, in, in, um, uh, you know, in, in uh, one of the questions is, uh, how should you make a model of something in the world? Well, as I say, for about 300 years, the, the answer was always, if you want to make a good model, make it as a mathematical equation. About, what is it now, 18 years ago, I published this big book. Look, see, I even have a prop here, um, the, uh, uh, which you can find online. Um, and uh, uh, it's a, it, that book is primarily about exploring the computational universe and understanding how to apply what one learns about the computational universe to the process of doing modeling um, of, of things in, in nature and elsewhere. Well, something really neat happened, which is that in the last probably uh, 15 years or so, there's really been quite a transition. If you look at sort of new models that people are constructing of things, the vast majority of new models are not mathematical equations. Instead, they're programs of some kind. You know, studying, I don't know, how people visit sites on the web or how some feature of plants works or something like this. These are models represented not as mathematical equations, but instead as programs. And it's sort of been a, a, a silent but very significant revolution in kind of the way science is, is thought about and done 
from a world in which a good model was always a mathematical equation to one in which a good model is a program. And that's it's kind of neat to see that transition happen. Now, one place that transition has not happened, had not happened, is in fundamental physics. In fact, when my, when my book, big book came out, lots of fields uh, had, uh, I would say, very, very kind of uh, a quick absorption of kind of the idea of, yes, you can use programs to make models of things, and this is some of what happens, you know, using cellular automata and, uh, and things like this to make kind of uh, as minimal models for, for lots of kinds of things. But in fundamental physics, people are saying, no, 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 it can't apply to fundamental physics. Um, because fundamental physics we know is fundamentally mathematical, and it's about you know, the, the, the differential geometry of, um, uh, of general relativity for, and, and so on. OK, but, but I had kind of an idea about maybe, just maybe, there's sort of a, a low-level machine code for the universe that is underneath what we currently know about and experience in terms of space and time and all the physics we know, that there's something lower level where, in fact, this discovery that very simple programs in the computational universe can do very complicated things is relevant and really tells us what's going on in physics. And so kind of the idea there is that um, uh, if, we, if we imagine, and it might not be true, that there is some simple model, there is some simple underlying rule for our universe. We don't know for sure that that's true. Um, but if that's true, we can say, well, what might that model be like? Okay, and um, the uh, so you know what might the sort of underlying stuff from which the universe is made be like? And what we expect is that that underlying stuff is not going to look very much like the things that we're familiar with at the scales we operate at. Because if you want to pack all the information about the universe, it's three dimensions of space. It's got this collection of electrons and muons and other particles, and it's got these gauge groups and so on. You don't get to pack all of that into a tiny little rule the size of something like rule 110 or something. So all of those things have to emerge um, uh, on a large scale from the behavior of this, of this underlying rule. You don't get to put it in the underlying rule. So the question then is, well, what might this underlying rule be like? What, what might, you know, what's the right way to think about um, sort of what the lowest level rule below space, below time, and so on for the universe might be like? And actually, what um, uh, so I, I thought about this first in the 1990s, and my basic conclusion was that the most plausible thing is that it has something to do with graphs and networks. That instead of you know in a cellular automaton, you've got this rigid array that's sort of a predefined notion of space, a predefined notion of steps in time, and so on. But what if one thought about things? What what is the most featureless way of thinking about uh, kind of the underlying structure of things? And I realized that kind of graphs and networks are part of that story. And then more recently, um, the, uh, uh, the realization was that, that actually the right way to think about it is in terms of just what one can think of as elements and relations. So uh, in a sense, and I'll talk about this some more later, my whole uh, story of Wolfram language and our uh, full-scale computational language to try and sort of represent everything in the world computationally, it's all based on the idea of symbolic expressions and transformations for symbolic expressions. But it turns out, and it took me, unfortunately, decades to realize this, it turns out that sort of if you, if you pull that back to its most abstract form, what it's really talking about at some level can be thought of as a bunch of rewrite rules for hypergraphs, or a bunch of ways in which one can uh, rewrite collections of elements and relations and so on. So it's a very, very abstract kind of model. And you can you can interpret that abstract model algebraic. You can interpret it in terms of graph theory. You can interpret it in terms of category theory, all kinds of different things. It's sort of an ultimate. It's, it's actually emerging as a bit of a Rosetta stone for, for kind of abstract formulations of things. Um, but in any case, the, the basic idea is to think about things in terms of sort of at the lowest level, it's just a collection of elements and relations. So for instance, we might uh, take, let me take an example here. Uh, let's see. So we might represent, um, uh, that might be something which just says, here are a bunch of binary relations between these elements. And all we say about these elements is they have, they have some identity. These could be UUIDs. They happen to be integers here. Now, we can represent that set of elements and relations in this particular case by a graph. Now, all we're going to do is say, Let's uh, let's just have rewrite rules that say how to transform uh, a piece of graph that looks like this, a piece of graph that matches this pattern, 
that has two identical elements and two elements that might be identical, they might not be, let's always transform that piece of graph into something like this, okay? So we can represent that rule by something like this. It's a very, very minimal kind of thing. You can think about this. In fact, I tried to make up a kind of way of doing distributed computing. Back in the 1980s, I worked on uh, massively parallel computation for a while, um, and I tried to make kind of a language for doing uh, parallel computation using uh, a, a, a way precursor of these ideas about graph rewriting. I didn't succeed at that time. But so the question then is, uh, what, what happens if you just run this rule a bunch of times? Okay, so this is what happens. Let's say we start off from this initial condition. We just apply that rule a bunch of times. Well, we end up getting a structure like this. Uh, just like in the case of rule 30, uh, in this case where we don't have any space, we don't have any time really, we, we've got a, um, we've just got this sort of underlying abstract structure, we again get this phenomenon where we get complicated behavior even from very simple rules. Okay, so what does this mean? Uh, how do we think about this in terms of physics? Well, the basic idea is to think about those elements, those abstract elements as what one might call atoms of space. The idea is to think about space as being formed from a, essentially a giant hypergraph, a giant network of some kind. So, you know, the tradition in, in mathematics and in physics for the last 2000 years, basically, has been to think of space as sort of a background in which everything operates and that space is continuous, that you can pick a point and that point can be anywhere in space and you can infinitesimally move that point and you can kind of use calculus and so on to study what happens. You can define manifolds. You can say there are uh, points sort of infinitesimally close to other points and so on. That's been the sort of tradition and sort of all of existing physics is formulated in terms of the idea that there is sort of this background of, of continuous space. That's in fact the very first common notion in Euclid is you know a point is that which has no part. A point is infinitesimal in size. So. What, what we're trying to do in this project is to say, let's, let's consider the, a different possibility. Let's consider that space is made of sort of atoms of space, discrete elements. And the only thing we know about these elements is how they're connected to other elements. And we think about them as related to other elements. Uh, if it was a graph, we just say every element is, there, there are binary relations between, between elements. We think about it as a hypergraph where there are enary relations between elements. And we just say, Everything in space, in fact, everything in the universe is just a giant collection of these uh, relations between elements. And in fact, in our particular universe, there might be uh, uh, maybe 10 to the 400 of these, um, uh, of these elements and relations that, that exist that, that build up the universe as we know it. Okay, so, so the idea then is that space is, is sort of represented by this hypergraph, the spatial hypergraph, and uh, the, the notion is that um, uh, uh, so, uh, and then what happens is that that um, time corresponds to the sort of uh, execution of computation that corresponds to these progressive rewritings of these pieces of the hypergraph according to some simple underlying rule. Okay, so one question is: Okay, you've got this hypergraph, but how does something like space emerge from this hypergraph? Well, it's very similar to the way that something like continuum fluid mechanics emerges from the discrete molecular dynamics of, of you know, a bunch of water molecules, air molecules, whatever, bouncing around. Um, it's something which emerges in this sort of continuum large-scale limit. And so what happens is certain of these spatial hypergraphs in the large-scale limit behave like manifolds with a certain number of dimensions. Sometimes they'll have integer dimensions. Sometimes they'll have non-integer dimensions. I think this particular one has dimension about 2.7. So this is, and, but on a large scale, it's like the case of fluid mechanics. It behaves as something that is effectively continuous. And by the way, um, uh, years ago, I invented this method for doing fluid mechanics by using discrete cellular automata instead of the realistic discrete molecules that you would find, or instead of going from kind of the Navier-Stokes equations and breaking them down by numerical analysis into discrete uh, sort of representations of those equations. Instead, go from the sort of discrete molecules. And, and you can do that because of the second law of thermodynamics, um, because of the fact that it actually doesn't matter to the large scale continuum limit. It actually doesn't matter whether you're dealing with air or water. They both give the Navier Stokes equations. You can kind of use that to say, let me pick the computationally most convenient things 
to operate on. And so that's a method that's emerged as a as one of the methods for doing fluid mechanics these days that's based on cellular automata and so on underneath. Um, well, in this case, instead of thinking of that as a model, as an idealization, we're saying that's how the universe actually works. It's actually based on these discrete atoms of space. Now, it turns out that if you're doing numerical relativity, um, as a, uh, the, it, it looks like it could actually be that this is actually a very good way to do very practical numerical relativity um, and possibly also numerical quantum field theory, but we'll talk about that perhaps later. Okay, so first thing is, what's the universe made of? It's, it's just made of this discrete hypergraph, giant hypergraph. So the question then is, um, and, that's, and that hypergraph kind of defines space, but actually the hypergraph defines everything in the universe. In some sense, we're saying that everything in the universe is just space. So what corresponds to particles and, and uh, you know, matter and all those kinds of things? Well, it's just features of this hypergraph. So if we look back at cellular automata, Here's an example in our rule, whoops, in our, moved to the wrong screen, hold on one second, go capture that, there we go. Um, the, uh, in the case of our rule 110 cellular automaton here, and why is that, okay. What we see is this produces, uh, it's, it's all just homogeneously represented in terms of this, you know, distributed computation system that where every cell is doing exactly the same thing. But nevertheless, on a large scale, you see this kind of particle-like structures that develop. And so that's the same kind of thing that we expect to have happen in the case of our spatial hypergraph, that even though, in a sense, everything is just space, it will turn out that there are essentially topological obstructions in space that correspond to things like particles. Okay, so that's sort of the structure of space. So, so one of the things then, so then the next question is, if you're trying to understand physics, what's time? So one of the things in physics has been this idea, there's this thing called space-time, in which space and time are just different coordinates, but they're the same kind of thing. In this model, that's not how things start out. Space is this hypergraph that is just a, a defined as a bunch of connections between things, but time is the inexorable process of uh, applying rules to that hypergraph to make it evolve to a different hypergraph. So in a sense, time is the process of computation Space is just the extent of this hypergraph. Okay, so, so then the question is, um, can, how can we, if we are an observer embedded within this universe, what, what do we think is going on? Well, it turns out that the only thing we can kind of be sensitive to is essentially the causal graph of what event, what updating event causes what updating event. And, and this is already starting to sound a little bit like uh, distributed computing and uh, kind of graphs, data flow graphs, and all kinds of things like this. But let me explain it both in physics terms and in computing terms. What's happening here in our universe is that there are a bunch of updating events. These are applications of our underlying rule. They say, turn this piece of hypergraph into this piece of hypergraph. And this is happening all over the universe all the time. And each one of those is an event. And each of those events needs certain input. It needs certain elements uh, that exist in the hypergraph, they need to be, that those elements are going to be processed by some event. But there's a definite ordering of what possible uh, order those events can happen in, because the inputs to, uh, to one event, which come, come out from the outputs to another event, they have to be ready. The, the previous event has to have happened um, before the next event can happen, because it's going to use the output from that previous event. So that defines a partial ordering. Um, on, on events, it defines a causal graph, it defines a, a network of causal relationships between events. And if you are an observer made from the same stuff that everything else is made from in this universe, the only thing you are ever going to be sensitive to is this causal graph of causal relationships between events. So that's, um, so that's kind of, uh, and that causal graph, those events happen at a certain place in, that we can think of them as happening at a certain place in space, and they are happening in a certain order in, quotes, time, defined by this set of causal relationships. Okay, next important fact. In certain rules, certain examples of these rules have a property that we call causal invariance. It's a property that has been kind of discovered and rediscovered in a bunch of fields of mathematics and computer science under a bunch of different names. It's known as the church rosser property in mathematical logic, confluence property, uh, eventual consistency in distributed databases. It's basically the property that 
you can have a system that makes transformations on things, but in the end, when you get the answer, it doesn't matter what order you made those transformations. So a common example of this is in doing algebra. If you're like expanding a polynomial or something like that, you can say, I can expand this piece of the polynomial first, or I can expand this piece of the polynomial first. It ultimately doesn't matter which order I do the expansion in, the final expanded polynomial will always have the same form. And that's this property that we call causal invariance. Causal invariance is something of a generalization of that, but that's basically the idea that you can follow different paths of history, but it doesn't matter which path you followed, you'll always get the same answer. Okay, so that property of causal invariance applied to this causal graph turns out to lead to an important conclusion. It's the reason that special relativity, Einstein's uh, theory of, of, of relativity works. And I can show you an example of that in, let's see if I can show you here. Um, let's consider a string rewriting system, okay? So this is, this is now simpler than a hypergraph. This is just a system in which we're taking a string of A's and B's, and we're saying at every step, replace BA by AB. That's our rule, okay? So this is a possible sequence of events. The yellow things are the events that take a BA and replace it by an AB. And so from this uh, and so in this particular case, we're starting off from this initial string. We're applying these particular events. And in the end, we'll get a sorted string down here where it's A is followed by Bs. Okay, so we can, uh, for that process, we can draw a causal graph that says which events, that says this event needs as its input things that are the output of these events here. Okay, so that's our causal graph. Okay, so big fact is that the... Uh, the, the causal network of what event has what effect on what event is independent of the precise microscopic ordering of those events. We can do those events in different ways, but we'll always have the same causal graph of relationships between the, the sort of input-output relationships between these events. Okay, so let's imagine now that we are, so we can represent that causal graph for, for the stringy writing system by something like this. These are the causal relationships between events. So we can think about this as being laid out in space and time. And this is showing us this event depends on these neighboring events in space that occurred at an earlier time. Okay, so if we are an observer in this kind of uh, toy universe, we, we might try to make sense of this toy universe and we might assign certain things. We might say, this is what we mean by simultaneity in time. This is what we mean. This, these are the events that happen simultaneously in time. This is a foliation of our causal graph that corresponds to a particular choice of what we mean by space and what we mean by time. Now we can pick a different choice. So for example, we could pick, uh, that's not a bad example there. Let's pick this example here where we are effectively uh, traveling at a certain speed through the system. So we're, we're, we're seeing new events that um, we, we see because, we are, because we're moving through the system. Now, we can say, well, we don't know we're moving. We're, we're just going to see what does the physics look like? What does the universe look like to us if we're just saying, we don't know we're moving, but then what do the events look like? Well, the, so this is the kind of distortion of the causal graph that we get by by uh, if we are in reality, in a sense, moving through this causal graph, this is how we think the causal graph is structured based on uh, just knowing about uh, what we are sensing about the causal graph. So it turns out you can already see if you, if you know how uh, sort of the derivation of special relativity works, um, you can already see that this is something closely related to that. In fact, the transformation that we have to use here is exactly Lorentz transformation um, to preserve the, um, uh, the, the, the structure of, of what's going on here. Now, so, okay, let, let's take a look at what that means for sort of the distributed computing stringy writing system. So this is kind of the, 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 uh, the most efficient way to rewrite this string of Bs and As and sort it. These are the events. You can do all these events at the same time. You can just keep going and you pretty soon you get to that result. Okay, so that will be what you would get if you did this kind of uh, 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 flat foliation of the causal graph of what computation is going on here. But let's say instead you do this foliation here, which is the kind of foliation that would be appropriate for an observer in motion and an inertial frame in motion uh, going across this kind of distributed computing universe. Okay, if you do that, in this case, this is the sequence of updating events that you would actually do. So what do you notice? Well, what you notice is 
that the, the, the number of steps it takes to get the string sorted is larger than it was previously, than it was when we picked that at rest kind of uh, foliation of, of, um, of our system. So what's going on here? Well, this is in fact exactly time dilation from special relativity, um, exactly mathematically identical to the phenomenon of time dilation in special relativity. But it's happening here essentially in a distributed computing system. It's happening in something where we're saying the time it takes, the number of steps it takes to sort the string is larger because we are picking a reference frame. We're picking a foliation in which our notion of simultaneity um, is different than it was before. So in any case, the big surprise from a physics point of view is that even though we have a model in which space and time are very different kinds of things, space is just the extent of this hypergraph, time is the sort of inexorable progress of computation, even though those are things of very different character, it's nevertheless the case that the phenomenon, the sort of key phenomenon of space-time, the, the feature of Lorentz invariance, relativistic invariance, the validity of special relativity, that emerges as a feature of these models. So that's kind of, a, kind of an exciting thing. Um, and we can kind of see how it starts to relate to things that we see in things like distributed computing. Okay, well, we can actually go further. And we can, by, by the way, I should say that the actual structure of a causal graph in an actual hypergraph rewriting system is vastly more complicated than what I showed you. This is even just a very toy version in the case of the uh, spatial hypergraph. The actual structure is, is very complicated. And that structure reflects the complexity of potential structure in space time. So, for example, if we were to have, um, uh, this is the formation of a cosmological event horizon, uh, kind of like a black hole. This is a causal graph, and this is showing that a piece of the causal graph is broken off. So in other words, there is communication. Uh, you can't, the things in here are, are causally communicating, the things over here are not. This is actually a, a two-way event horizon, but there's an analogous situation with a one-way event horizon that corresponds to a black hole, basically, where there is, uh, communication inside one part and communication from that part into that part, but not the other way around. So the structure of these causal graphs represents, we can interpret that in terms of phenomena we know in space-time. We can also imagine if this was a blockchain, for example, if this was some kind of distributed blockchain-like thing, this would be a fork in the blockchain uh, where we are sort of taking causal information on one side and it doesn't interact with the other side. Okay. So the next thing in physics is um, understanding uh, the structure of space-time, and in particular, understanding phenomena like gravity. Gravity in, in, in physics is thought of uh, as curvature in space-time. Well, we can think of that um, in terms of, um, uh, so, so our, um, uh, we, we, can, we, we can think of these graphs um, Okay, so first question about these graphs is, okay, you've got one of these graphs, you know, here are a bunch of different graphs from different rules, a bunch more here. What dimension are these things? How do we measure the dimension of something like this? Well, so there's an easy way to do that. We can just think about it in terms of graph theory. We can just think, imagine that we start at a particular point in the graph, and then we just go a certain graph distance r away from that point, and we grow the size of this ball in the graph. Then we can simply ask the question, how many distinct nodes of the graph do we reach by going graph distance r in the graph? And we look at the, the growth rate of that, uh, of that quantity. If that quantity grows like r to the d for some d, then it, we can think of it as corresponding to d-dimensional space. So for example, if we do the same thing for a different graph here, that's one that happens to behave like three-dimensional space. But we can do it also for the graph that we generated from our uh, model of physics, and in this particular case, for this particular rule, um, as I mentioned, the uh, the effective dimension we get is about 2.7. And if we look here, this is just measuring the growth rate of that ball, and we've got several limits going on. We've got the limit of, of ev evolution of the graph, and we've got limits of size of ball, and we've got other limits going on. But in the end, we're, we're trying to we're trying to figure out what's the effective limit of this growth rate, and it's about uh, r to the 2.7. Sometimes we get um, uh, rules that, like, there's an example of a rule. This is, happens to be drawn in three dimensions, but this is a rule out here. I'll show you what it started from. That's what it started from. It's just a rule. It just applies itself to hypergraph. After you go for a while, it'll look like this, which looks like kind of two-dimensional space, a bit curved. Actually, the full thing 
uh, rendered as a, a sort of surface in three dimensions. Although remember that in the actual model, all we have is connectivity information. We don't have any of this information about where the points should be placed in space or what the surface should look like and so on. That's all just emergent uh, behavior. Um, but in any case, we can then, not only can we talk about the dimension of space, that's the leading R to the D term, but there's a subleading term that's proportional to R squared that it depends on the um, uh, uh, that, that depends on the um, uh, the curvature of space. I mean, kind of see that if you look at you know what's the area of a circle. Well, it's pi r squared. Um, but um, uh, if we look at that circle drawn on a sphere, there'll be a correction term to that pi r squared that will be something proportional to the curvature of the sphere. And we can use the same kind of idea in a graph to estimate uh, curvature. And so, for example, here this is that curved two-dimensional graph, and we see it's not exactly a two-dimensional thing here. This is looking at the growth rate of the GDC ball in this graph. It has curvature, positive curvature in this case, that's associated with a, a deviation from that in this picture. OK, so what? Well, so we've now got a way of kind of measuring curvature for our spatial hypergraph. We can also talk about GD6 in the spatial hypergraph, that is, shortest paths between points in our graph. Now, in, in, in physics, GD6 are thought of uh, in space-time as being the paths that particles on which no forces are acting will follow. So, you know, a photon, for example, where no force is acting on it, it'll follow a GD6 path in space-time. And if space-time is flat, that means the photon is just going in a straight line. If space-time is curved by the presence of, let's say, the sun or something, or a black hole, the, 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 um, uh, the photon will be, will be uh, its path will deviate um, because uh, the GD6 is no longer a straight line. Okay, exact same behavior in the case of our spatial hypergraph. We can think about what is the, what are the behavior of these GD6 in our spatial hypergraph. And amazing fact is that if we look at the large scale behavior of these spatial hypergraphs, and we assume that we're only gonna have finite dimensional space and we make certain assumptions about computational irreducibility and its implications for ergodicity and so on. If we make those assumptions, we can then derive certain large-scale properties of space-time. And the amazing thing is that the large-scale properties that we derive are exactly the Einstein equations. So in the case of fluids, we go from molecular dynamics to go to the Navier-Stokes equations, which are the kind of continuum description. When we do the same thing in our spatial hypergraphs, the continuum description is the Einstein equations, which say things about the curvature of space-time. Well, one feature of the Einstein equations is they both have a sort of form where they're talking about just the vacuum, pure space, the structure of space, the curvature in space, things like that. But they also talk about matter in space. One of the surprising things that we realized in, um, uh, in, in studying these models is that we can understand something about what matter is. Even without knowing the details of what particles exist in a particular rule, we can understand sort of generally what matter is. And the answer is, it's kind of activity in the network. That's what energy is activity in the network. And that's measured by looking at the causal graph and by asking what, how many causal edges, what is the flux of causal edges through what we can call space-like hypersurfaces. In, in relativity, one identifies the notion of time-like uh, vectors and space-like vectors. A time-like vector is one where uh, it goes from, uh, from one point in space-time to something where the point that it goes to is something that is causally connected to the point it came from. It is, it is following the passage of time to where it goes to. The other possibility is sort of the, the, uh, the what's orthogonal to that, which is space-like separation, where two points can be space-like separated if they can be considered to happen simultaneously, if there's a foliation where they happen simultaneously. So uh, the, we can have many different foliations of this causal graph, but energy, is the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces, which is essentially a measure. Uh, the, the causal edges are essentially a measure of how many events are happening, how much activity is there in the network. OK, so then it turns out you can then derive uh, sort of a, a nice thing to do is to derive E equals mc squared and the relationship between energy and mass, which just as a consequence of this identification of energy as flux of causal edges um, and the general properties of causal graphs. OK. So, so then we have a notion of energy, we have a notion of mass, then it turns out we can derive Einstein's equations uh, and we can derive the, the relationship between curvature of space and the presence of mass and energy in space. And in particular, what happens there is that there is um, the, uh, the main conclusion is that a JD-SIC will be turned by the presence of uh, that energy. 
So that's that's what we know happens in general relativity. A, a geodesic is no longer a straight line, but the presence of energy causes the geodesic to bend, and that's what is associated with the with the force of gravity. Okay, so so in our models, from basically nothing, from just talking about elements and relations and hypergraphs and things, we're able to derive as a large scale limit the Einstein equations for general relativity. So that's a kind of an exciting thing. I actually knew that particular thing back in the 1990s. Um, but uh, we've sort of cleaned that up in more recent times. So, okay, so that's how uh, gravity arises. And um, we can make a lot of analogies between what's happening in, in our sort of distributed, the, the universe is in a sense, the ultimate distributed computing system. It's got all these events that are happening. It's all these processes that are going on all independently at different points in space. So one of the important things is that these updating events uh, there is this particular graph was made by picking a particular sequence of updating events. But actually, there's a lot of ambiguity in where these updating events can happen. There are many possible race conditions of the universe, so to speak. There are many places where the, the particular order of updating events is not determined. There are many choices of, of updating event orders that, that can occur. So that So then the question is, how do we understand that? Okay, so the way we understand that is in terms of what we call the multi-way graph. Um, multi-way graph basically is representing all possible uh, updating orders that can be used. So essentially what we're seeing here, and let, let me just explain how this works in physics, and then I'll go back and talk a little bit about the, the more computing aspect of the multi-way graph. Um, so what's happening is we start off from a particular state of the system. It might be this hypergraph here, and there are many possible places where these updating events could happen. There are many possible orderings in which those updating events can happen. Because of causal invariance, it ultimately doesn't matter what order we pick. That's a very critical fact. It ultimately doesn't matter in what order we do our computations. We'll always get the same answer in the end. Now, it's a little bit complicated because if the answer is a fixed thing, like a polynomial or something, if we get to a normal form, if, we, if our computation terminates, that's one thing. But the universe, we hope, doesn't terminate. And, and in fact, most distributed computing systems used in practice don't terminate. Um, they just keep going. And so causal invariance is a little bit more subtle. And this idea of you can always get to the same point is a little bit more subtle than just saying you'll always get the, the final same answer. But OK, so you have causal invariance. And you have this sort of whole graph of possible um, updating event, of possible states that the universe can effectively get into. OK, so uh, th there are all these different states. and. What happens is they can both branch, that is, at a particular in a particular state, two different updating events can occur that lead to different states, but they can also merge in the sense that two different up two different sequences of updating events can lead to the same final state. Okay, so so what? What does this mean in physics? Well, turns out there's this phenomenon in physics that's been known for a hundred years, which is quantum mechanics. In classical physics, we imagine that definite things always happen in the world. You know, we throw a ball, it goes in a definite trajectory. The main thing about quantum mechanics, which is describing things like electrons and photons and so on, is that in quantum mechanics, we don't say definite things happen. We say, actually, there's many possible paths that are being followed, and we're somehow adding them up, and we're just working out probabilities of what's going on. So the, the quantum mechanics is the idea that many paths get followed. Well, actually, that's exactly what happens in these models. It is an inevitable feature of the structure of these models that you have to have quantum mechanics, that you have to have something where there's this whole kind of structure of possible branchings and things. So, OK, so once you've got that, you can ask questions about, uh, about quantum mechanics. And, and so what happens roughly is that, uh, so when we look at this, the, each of these states here is a different quantum state. And when we're looking across here, we can basically be talking about if we're, uh, okay, so, so an observer who is also quantum mechanical is observing this process. The observer, just like in relativity, you pick these, these frames of, uh, that are associated with motion in relativity. So in quantum mechanics, we've realized we pick what we call quantum observation frames, quaffs, um, that are the way that we as observers of the universe are choosing to think about the different branching quantum histories. And so we can actually kind of make a map, just as from this causal graph here that represents space and time, we can kind of make a map of space that corresponds to something simultaneous in time. So we can do the same thing in the space of quantum states. We can kind of make a map 
of what happens at a particular time. And, and we call this branchial space, the space of branchings in quantum mechanics. And this is a branchial graph in branchial space. And that branchial graph, the interpretation of that branchial graph in physics is that it's a map of quantum entanglements. It's a map of the entanglements, essentially the shared common ancestry of different quantum states. And so the picture that we have is um, while space-time and relativity is something operating in physical space in this extent of the spatial hypergraph, quantum mechanics is a story of things happening in branchial space, in the space of all possible branchings here. So, so that means, so then the question is, um, in branchial space, kind of, for example, what does motion look like in branchial space? What does, um, uh, if we are looking at a geodesic moving through this multi-way graph, if we're looking at, uh, we start in a particular state here, we're going to another state, uh, we follow a geodesic from one state to the next, what, what, what can we say about the, what that geodesic does? Is it a straight line in branchial space? What is it, what is it like? So, the answer is, and this is, a, to me, it's one of the most amazing things that's emerged in this physics project, is you can ask, what's the analog of the Einstein equations in branchial space? What's the analog of the thing that tells you the way that JD6 are, are, are deflected in branchial space? Well, it turns out that the deflection of JD6 in branchial space is like the presence of energy, or actually more accurately, Lagrangian density in branchial space is associated with, again, the flux of causal edges now in the multi-way causal graph rather than the ordinary causal graph. And that flux of causal edges is what causes the deflection of JD6 in the multi-way graph. And it turns out the deflection of JD6 in the multi-way graph is, uh, well, okay, so it is precisely the path integral of quantum field theory. So the this sort of standard high-end formulation of quantum mechanics is a thing, uh, Dick Feynman's path integral, um, that is a way of, of explaining quantum mechanics in terms of adding up the effects of many different histories. And the way those histories are added up, they are added up with a certain phase factor. And that phase factor, we can now interpret as being associated with the amount of turning that happens in branchial space. And so what ends up happening is the Feynman path integral is the Einstein equations, but in branchial space. So in other words, the fundamental theories of gravitation and quantum mechanics which have always seemed to be somewhat far apart, it actually turns out they're the same theory. They're just operating in different forms of space, in branchial space versus in, in, in physical space. Okay, so, so there are many consequences. So for example, one thing you might ask is what does this mean for quantum computing? How do we interpret this as a quantum computer? Well, you can think about this as a quantum computer. Its big sort of killer feature is it's able to sort of tree out many different possibilities. It's trying to do factoring or something. It's, it's looking, it's doing that quantum Fourier transform by, by looking at all the possible periodicities all at the same time, all in parallel. And that's exactly what's happening in this multi-way graph. One is treeing out uh, these possible, um, uh, th these, possible um, uh, these possible things that happen. That is kind of the phenomenon that is potentially leading to uh, what we think of as quantum computing. Um, now, turns out there's a bit of a problem in quantum computing. You can use the formalism of quantum mechanics to understand how you can get all these things happening in parallel, but then in the end, you want to actually get an answer. So you have to measure, you know, perform this operation of measurement in quantum mechanics. It's always been kind of a mysterious thing in quantum mechanics. What is this measurement process? What turns one from having this set of sort of quantum possibilities to a definite classical, this definite thing happened in the universe uh, uh, thing? Actually, back in a little bit after 1980, um, I actually uh, did a bunch of work with, with Dick Feynman um, on quantum computing long before anybody thought about quantum computing. And one of the things we concluded was it's actually non-trivial to make this whole measurement thing work. It's not obvious that you're going to actually get the, the kind of nominal advantages of quantum computing that you would expect. Well, finally, we have a model in which we can actually understand the measurement process um, in sort of microscopic detail. And essentially what's happening is, as we do the, the sort of the quantum mechanics, trees things out, we branch out, we, we move outwards in branchial space. Um, the, uh, uh, but then measurement is sort of corralling things back to the point where we know that something definite happened. So in a sense, there's a sort of quantum process that's moving things outwards. Then there's this measurement process that's trying to corral things back. Now in an actual quantum computer, um, the sort of the difficulties of measurement all have to do with decoherence times and things like this.
But in our theory, we're able to start start looking at that. And actually, one of the things that you know, if you say, well, do we really reproduce quantum mechanics? Well, so one of the ways to prove that is a very computational way. So we have a quantum computing framework in Wolfram Language, and um, the question is, can we compile operations in the quantum computing framework into multi-way systems? And we have, I think we just posted it a few days ago, or maybe it's about to get posted, the first version of a compiler um, from, it's done by Jonathan Gorard, who's one of the, one of the people working on this project. Um, the, uh, the first version of a compiler um, that goes from, uh, from quantum mechanics, from a quantum computing, from standard quantum computing formalism to multi-way systems. So it's kind of proving that multi-way systems really do do what quantum mechanics says should happen. But we can go further than traditional quantum mechanics because we can represent measurement as well. And we can ask the question, we don't yet know completely the answer, although I suspect I know how it's going to come out, of whether really quantum computing can actually get you anywhere. Um, in other words, it's a great thing to study sort of physics applied to computing and, um, and, and you know, figure out quantum effects and so on. But the question is, does the genuine quantum brand really deserve to be there? Can you really get to things that you couldn't get to in any, in principle, in any, in any non-quantum way? My guess is the answer is going to be no. My guess is whatever you gain by doing, by the sort of quantum branching out, you're going to lose in the measurement process. And actually, in a more extreme fashion, um, I suspect, so uh, one of the sort of uh, weird secrets of general relativity and theory of gravity is, you know, you learn in school that energy is conserved. Well, actually, energy is not conserved for the whole universe on a cosmological scale. Um, and so, in principle, the expansion of the universe allows you to mine that lack of energy conservation. Imagine you just connected a spring between sort of the central black holes of two distant galaxies that are part of the expansion of the universe. That spring would progressively get potential energy as a result of the expansion of the universe. It would kind of trade off sort of the energy of the Big Bang for the energy of the, of the universe. And so that's a way that you can kind of make a, a perpetual motion machine in some sense, uh, even in, 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 in classical physics. So I think my guess is that the story of quantum computing is going to be the only way in which you actually gain something is through the expansion of the universe in branchial space. Um, now, we don't actually know. The universe may be expanding incredibly fast in branchial space. And it may be that there's actually the analog of a Hubble flow, um, you know, the expansion of the physical universe, actually might be something that is of, of laboratory or, you know, or operational use. We might actually be able to use that branchial expansion in practice, or we might not, or it might be orders of magnitude away from something that, that can actually be sensed at a, at a technological level. Okay, so in any case, this is... Um, uh, so that's a little bit of a sketch of, of this, this um, uh, uh, some of what happens in this theory of physics. Um, and now I want to say that, that um, we talk about race conditions in, in distributed computing. Those are branch pairs in quantum mechanics. Those are the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics is the story of race conditions. So what happens is in space time, so it, it's a very unified thing. In space time, if you go out in two different directions, and you make kind of a rectangle. You go out in those directions, you go along a parallel direction, you go back again. The question is, does that picture close? So in a curved space, that rectangle will not close. That's a consequence of curvature. It's measured by the Riemann tensor. Um, and that's, uh, that's sort of the, um, uh, so you, know, you, you, you go in these two directions in space, that, that, that's what happens. In, in branchial space, you can do the same thing. And that's what corresponds to kind of going in the position direction and the momentum direction. Uh, and making an uncertainty, making a commutator in quantum mechanics, uh, sort of evaluating the uncertainty principle for quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, there is this uncertainty principle that says it matters uh, which operation you do first, which operation you do second. They don't commute with each other. Exact same thing in distributed computing. And for the exact same reason, there is you're forming branch pairs effectively that, um, that, uh, uh, that do not resolve because they have a non-zero commutator. And you can sort of measure that in, in quantum mechanics. It's associated with h-bar, Planck's constant. Um, here, uh, it's, a, it's sort of a different unit system, but it's the same idea. So you can ask questions like, uh, can you make a distributed computing system in which those branch pairs resolve? Well, you need causal invariance to do that. You need eventual consistency to do that. So here's an example of something we've been thinking about recently. Uh, which is distributed blockchain type, distributed computing for things like blockchain. So in a blockchain, you have a very simple way of maintaining a consistent ledger, which is you just have the sequence of, of, of blocks in time. 
you know, each block is, is has a hash of previous blocks. So the question is, um, and, and that's well and good, but it takes a long time for uh, to sort of get consensus to have every copy of the blockchain uh, make sure that it agrees with every other copy. Let's imagine that instead you were doing transactions all over the universe, so to speak, and each one was a separate transaction. And let's imagine that you want that you have some kind of causal invariance which leads to eventual consistency. But locally, you can do transactions very quickly and you don't necessarily have that consistency. So kind of what, you, what you're working towards is something like the following picture. And I, I, there's many more details to this and, and we don't know all of them yet. Um, but uh, it's kind of an uncertainty principle of money, let's say. You're doing uh, you know, cryptocurrency transactions and you say, okay, you've got a choice. You can either be absolutely certain you have the right balance, but then you've got to take a long time and everything's got to be all of the light cones that correspond to knowing what effect things can have on what, on what things. They all have to uh, resolve to the point where you can know that there's global consistency. Or you can say, no, I don't care about that. I just want to do transactions very quickly, even if they'll be slightly wrong. And that means you can, you can do local transactions and there ends up being an uncertainty principle, a, a trade-off between time and accuracy of your, of your bank balance, so to speak, um, that, uh, that you see emerging there. We don't know all the details of this, but it looks extremely promising that it's possible to make a kind of model of distributed computing um, in which one is effectively just using the ideas of physics. Um, and one's using the language of physics to be able to see um, how that um, how that can be worked out. And it's kind of interesting that you know we quickly realize that there are issues like event horizons, the forking, I already mentioned that earlier. Um, there are issues about, um, uh, well, the, the, it turns out that to maintain consistency, you need a bunch of background autonomous events happening in addition to the intentional events that are added by people actually trying to do things in the distributed computing system. And that's very similar to what happens in, in physics, where essentially if we look at the events that are happening in our spatial hypergraph, we have at least one estimate of sort of how, how the, the magnitude of things in that spatial hypergraph. Um, of all the things that are going on, only one part in 10 to the 120 is not just associated with the knitting together, maintaining the structure of space. So everything that we sort of are sensitive to about matter and all those kinds of things, it's all, uh, uh, that's only one part in 10 to the 121. I realized, when did I start here? I've been going on much longer than I should have done. But, but let me, I, I didn't talk about, let me, let me talk about just a few more things and then, then we can, um, I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, to do questions if we still have time for that. Um, I want to mention one more level of abstraction beyond even what we've done with the universe here. So one feature of the universe that we're talking about here is we say there is a definite rule, and that rule is what we run for however many steps to make our universe. But you say, why that rule and not another rule? Okay, so there's an even bigger generalization, which is to say, let's consider, let's consider the possibility that at every step, every possible rule could be applied, not just the specific rule, but every possible rule. Well, it turns out that then there's a, a, a causal invariance is actually almost inevitable in that case. And it turns out that then, in a sense, we can think of the universe as being a universe of all possible universes. And then it turns out that our notion of reference frames is essentially the description language that we're using to try and describe the universe. And so this question of what rule do we say operates the universe ends up being something that is all about the description language, which corresponds to the reference frame in which we are sort of slicing the universe in what we call ruleal space, the space of all possible rules. Well, I did a little bit of investigation of this recently. Let me try and show you something here. Let me see if I can show you this. Okay, so just in the context of Turing machines, we can ask about ruleal space. So there's a little friendly Turing machine. That's, uh, that's the evolution of that Turing machine. Now we can ask about, this is a deterministic Turing machine. Every step follows from the previous step. This is a non-deterministic Turing machine. This is the multi-way graph of a non-deterministic Turing machine in which starting from this initial state, there are two different possible paths that the Turing machine can follow. Okay, so let's now ask about the ruleal space of Turing machines. Let's ask about, about the maximally non-deterministic Turing machine. Let's just ask about a Turing machine that can follow any possible rule. Let's say it's just a two-state, two-color Turing machine, starting, let's say, from this blank, blank tape here. So this is now showing the multi-way graph, the sort of ultra-multi-way graph of all possible uh, paths followed by all possible non-deterministic Turing machines. 
Okay, so we keep going a while, and uh, let's see if I've got a picture of that. I think that's a, um, is that it? No, that, that's, that's, the, um, uh, that's the sort of bigger piece of, of the Rulial Turing, Turing machine graph. Okay, so, so for example, it turns out this has a group structure. It's actually the Cayley graph of a group um, that corresponds to this. You can make this kind of Rulial space, and I don't really know what the continuum limit is, although I know what kind of group it is, and, I, and probably geometric group theory would tell you things about what that limit looks like, but this, I figured this out a week ago, so don't know that yet. Um, so, so we can ask questions like, this picture is sort of the, the maximally non-deterministic form of computation. But so one question we can then ask is um, what, let's see if I have a picture here. Um, uh, where do we go here? Okay, there we go. So we can ask for a particular Turing machine, okay? A particular deterministic Turing machine is following a path through this Rulial space of possible Turing machine paths. That's a, that's a particular Turing machine following that path, okay? So that's deterministic computation embedded in this, in this sort of bed of non-deterministic computation. So then we can ask, what is the structure of all possible deterministic Turing machines? What is the, the geodesic ball formed by deterministic Turing machines in this underlying space of non-determinism? Okay, that's what it looks like. Okay, so the reason this is sort of interesting is um, uh, if we are interested in, in P versus NP and things like that, the comparison between uh, deterministic, in that case, polynomial time computations and non-deterministic computations, we're asking, that turns out to be a question of what the geometrical structure of this kind of region formed by the limit of all possible deterministic computations as compared to this background of all possible non-deterministic computations. So in a sense, what this allows one to do, and this is something I realized only in the last few weeks, is this provides a geometrization of the P versus NP problem. And you can start to see questions about the decidability or undecidability of P versus NP by asking questions about what this limit looks like. But in any case, this is a this is kind of part of the spin-off, the story of the spin-off. I mean, this is a picture. This is actually deterministic Turing machine space, um, the space of all possible deterministic Turing machines. That's, that's some part of that space. Um, and this is studying that space and the comparison between that space and this Turing machine group space associated with non-deterministic machines, I think is a, is a very interesting direction that gives one, it begins from a sort of empirical study of computational complexity theory and goes into something, something rather different. But that's part of the kind of, it's a sort of fascinating spin-off for me um, of, of this physics project into something which is really just a core question of, of theoretical computer science. Now, I should say that when we talk about this Rulial space, or I should say when, when we, in physical space, the maximum speed of information propagation is the speed of light. Um, that determines how fast we can go in physical space. In, in branchial space, in the space of quantum entanglements, there is another quantity, we call it zeta, which is a maximum entanglement speed. That's a new thing that's arisen from our theory, the idea that there is such a thing. Um, that quantity governs the maximum rate at which you can entangle new quantum degrees of freedom. It, it would ultimately govern the maximum rate of quantum computing um, it governs the speed at which you can kind of entangle more quantum degrees of freedom. And we don't know how big it is. We've got some estimates. Maybe it's about 10 to the 5 solar masses per second, might be the, the maximum entanglement speed, um, and which means it might be observable in some black hole mergers and, and other such things, which will, be, which will be really cool. But in any case, when we look at Rulial space, there's yet again another maximum speed. And that maximum speed is now a very purely computational thing. It relates to the maximum speed at which you can make, um, uh, at which you can essentially translate from one description of the universe to another. By the way, I should say that in branchial space, the analog of a black hole, the analog of an event horizon is a qubit of the kind that you see in, in quantum computers. A qubit is something where you're trying to preserve a quantum degree of freedom untouched by what happens outside. You need essentially an event horizon in branchial space to prevent decoherence of the quantum computer. In the case of, um, uh, of Rulial space, the analog of a black hole, the analog of, a, of an event horizon is actually the presence of computational reducibility in the system. So most of the, the progress of time is sort of inexorable and, and is, is governed by, is computationally irreducible, but there can be places where kind of 
the answer is determined, and those are those are essentially uh, those are walled off by event horizons, and those correspond to lumps of computational reducibility in the space. But then you realize that there's a quantity we're calling it rho, um, which is the maximum rate of information propagation in real space, and that's a thing that essentially knits together pure computation with physics. And so the units of that are basically processing speed. They relate to the core processing speed of the universe. And so it's the rate at which a computation can happen in the universe. You can measure it in Turing machine speeds. I would I prefer to measure it in, in Wolfram language operations per second. Um, it's the number of Wolfram language operations per second performed by the universe. Now, you can have a different description language. So let, let me just segue, and, and I'll, I'll try to finish off here. But, but talking about kind of the role of um, uh, how I see uh, computer language and and so on in in, in the ter in terms of, of these kinds of things. So so one of the things you know if we if we look at um, uh, the 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 um, uh, let's see um, if we look at kind of um, so you know I've spent much of my life building this thing we call Wolfram language and um, kind of the idea of Wolfram language is to is to have something where where we have a representation of lots of things in the world computationally. See, the way I see things is, uh, you know, the computational universe is capable of many things. It has all those complicated rule 30 cellular automata. It has all these things that may model the physical universe in it. It has lots of possibilities. The computational universe is full of possibilities. The question is, how do we humans figure out what we actually want to do in this computational universe of possibilities? And that means we have to build a bridge between the things we think about and what can happen in the computational universe. And that bridge, as far as I'm concerned, is computational language. It is what we've been building in Wolfram language. And the idea is that we want to be able to represent everything we think about in the world in computational terms so that we can use sort of the power of the computational universe to, to work with it. And kind of I view that what we're doing is kind of the analog as what, of what was done 400 years ago when mathematical notation was invented. We, we got a notation. Before that time, it was very difficult to, to formulate things mathematically, even to think about them as a human mathematically, um, because we didn't have kind of a language in which to formulate those things. So, so kind of the idea in Wolfram language is to provide a language for thinking about everything computationally. So for example, I might say, I don't know whether this will work. Let's see which image it will pick up here. Um, let's pick up a, um, oh, there we go. OK, fine. We've got, um, let's we'll take that image. So now we can say, let's take that image. And we can say, let's say, uh, you know, ah. um, edge detect that image. So we're just doing a computation here. Or we might say, um, let's take that image, um, always a dangerous thing to do, and let's say, uh, let's, let's run a neural network. Let's say image identify that, um, uh, that, that image, uh, see what it does. Um, or we could say something like, um, I think it's just, OK, great, it's at a person. That's good. Or we could say, let's, let's look at that network from a, um, uh, let's see where it is. Um, we want. Um, uh, image identify net. There we go. So this is now a representation of that network, the network that actually did uh, did the computation here. So we can we can say let's drill into that network. Here it is. Um, let's say we apply that network to this picture, but instead of applying the um, uh, the whole network, let's just take the first I don't know ten levels of that network. We're kind of seeing inside the brain of this AI. Um, we're we're seeing. Okay, here we go. Let's let's just do this. Let's say. Um, uh, okay, so that's that's showing us images that were part of kind of the internal thinking of that image identification system. Or we could maybe say, let's show ourselves a you know a feature space plot of those things um, uh, that um, is tried to arrange in feature space. You know what what thing is like what other thing. So okay, so that that um, that was that. Okay, so this is kind of representing um, uh, things like images in computational terms. And for example, we could represent all the hypergraphs, and you know, we could make a um, let's just make a random graph here with um, I don't know, let's say uh, I don't know, three hundred. Uh, let's just make some random graph, and we could take that random graph, and we could say you know, find um, uh, uh, let's make a um, oops, what I wanted. Um, let's let's take that and find sort of communities in that graph, something like this. 
Um, so we can do these kinds of things that involve sort of abstract computation, but we can also deal with concrete computation. So for example, let's say I type in Warsaw, and I'm using natural language understanding here to resolve that as an actual entity in the world. And so for example, I could say something like, what's the population there? Okay, it'll give me an answer. Maybe I can say, show me that. Um, let's see whether I can get out of time series here. I'm not sure if I can. Um, okay, not that many points, but we can just say make a plot of um, uh, of the of the um, uh, population of Warsaw as a function of time, apparently since 1700 here. Um, and uh, so we, we have all of this data about the world now represented computationally. So for example, if I say something like, you know, I don't know, capital cities in Europe, let's say, um, I could get out, uh, so there I'll get something where we have information about that. And then we could say something like find, um, uh, let's, let's just find the geo positions of all those cities. Um, so now, um, and then, okay, so now let's say we say find uh, shortest tour, for example, for those geo positions. So that's gonna tell me uh, a traveling salesman tour of those cities. So let's say, let's, let's pick, let's take our cities there. Let's just take the cities, they were on line 29. And let's say, um, uh, take those cities in the order of this thing we just got here. Um, and uh, okay, now let's say geo list plot, and then we should be able to get, we should hopefully be able to get a picture that shows us um, shows us our traveling salesman tour of the, of the cities of Europe. Okay, so to me, it's quite remarkable and important that it's possible to, to just represent things like cities or, or movies or chemicals or whatever in computational terms and just be able to think about them computationally. And kind of the idea is that, you know, if I were to pick these things together, find shortest tour of a geolist plot of that, I, I, as a human, could perfectly well read that piece of computational language. I could use that as a form of communication. And this, this notebook that we have here, we invented this kind of notebook idea 30 years ago, and finally people realized, oh, this is an interesting thing 27 years later. But anyway, the, um, uh, so you know, we, can, we could say here, this is a, a section about uh, geodata or some, some such other thing. So this is, um, 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 we can you know, close that up and, and uh, treat it as a, an outline or something like this. So, so, and this is a, a, you know, I could take this notebook here and I could say, let's, let's publish this notebook to the cloud. Okay, so I'll say, it'll say here, let's just, uh, let's just automatically assign a URL. We can publish this to the cloud and then we'll actually have a version, the same user interface that I'm running here. There's an analog of it in the cloud and you can run the same thing in the cloud. Okay, there's the, there's the, the notebook in the cloud. I can go and look at that um, and I can do computations on this notebook if I want to. Um, there we go. Um, and I could go and, um, and take that, that notebook. Um, in this case, I'd make my own copy, and then I'd start computing things directly in the cloud. There's just a web browser here. Um, I'd probably take one of those pictures and start like expanding it and just in the web browser and so on, um, and, uh, and do all the computations I was doing. It's an important practical thing in terms of, of communicating computational X uh, to people that it's possible to do that. But kind of in the bigger picture, uh, and I, I should also say, important sort of practical feature, if I do, um, uh, let's just say, um, let's see what will happen here. If I, if I just do, um, oh, actually, what I, oh, this is, this is showing up all the different computers that I have in my, in my house here. Um, uh, it'll, it'll just be starting up um, uh, versions of the Wolfram engine on, on all these computers, and I'll be uh, computing in parallel just this very boring uh, dollar process ID. Um, but this is kind of, I, I, could, I could show you a bunch of things to do with actual practical distributed computing. Um, in this physics project, we've made great use of, uh, okay, great, one of my computers is down, so it goes. That's life of a, of a distributed computing world. Let's see if I do, um, uh, I think everyone is unique there, okay. Um, if I were to say something like table of dollar process ID, um, comma a thousand, I would get a thousand copies and, um, oops, I didn't mean that, I meant parallel table. Um, so I want that in parallel. Uh, and now I would get something where those have been distributed across a bunch of different computers. So we see it allocated 11, 11 of those processes to most of my computers and 10 to one of them. Okay, so, so what's the significance of this, um, this idea of computational language? So this is kind of, uh, you know, this is, 
an attempt to provide a language that allows us to kind of tell the AIs what to do, to define sort of computational contracts for what the AIs should do. Um, when we think about uh, sort of a, a bunch to say about distributed computing and the kind of relationship to blockchain and, and computational contracts and so on, let me not go down that path. Um, but the, the basic point here is what we're trying to do is define this computational language, which is a bridge between human thinking and something where we can sharpen up our thinking about computation by thinking in terms of this language and what the AIs and the computers can do um, on the other side. And we're trying to sort of collect the computational knowledge of the world to make that available through this computational language. So that's been the picture for the last uh, few decades is what I've been working on is trying to build this computational language, trying to identify, you know, and if we look at this language, there are just uh, lots of different uh, lots of different kinds of areas that we have to cover in, um, uh, in this language. Um, to represent all the kinds of things we want, you know, like we just added videos, for example, and and being able to process videos, or or doing um, uh, all kinds of all kinds of different things here, uh, doing natural language processing, all those kinds of things. Um, the uh, uh, so you know that's that's one side of what we've been doing is trying to trying to really make it be the case that we can represent anything we think about, we can represent computationally in this language. So now in doing physics we've added another piece to this, which is what does it mean to make a model of physics? Well, what it means is you've got the physical world over here, you've got our thinking about what's going on over here, and can we, can we kind of connect these together? And what we've kind of realized is it's a three-way story. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make a language for describing physics that is implementable on computers and whose elements are understandable by us humans. You know, physics just does its thing. The question is, can we understand what it's doing? We need the medium, as it's turned out, we need the medium of computers to have that understanding. Just from 100 years ago, when people were building what has been traditional physics, they didn't have computers. They didn't have this, this extra piece to, to the ability to understand things. We now do have that. This is what we've built now is sort of a, a way of understanding physics that's fundamentally based on computation. Um, and what we're doing essentially in understanding physics is we've got to build a language that is a language that is understandable to us humans that represents physics through the intermediation of, of, of computation. Now, it turns out that language, one of the things that I thought would be interesting to, to chat with you guys about, that language that we're inventing for describing physics is a language of distributed computing. It's a language where fundamentally just because it's because space in the universe is distributed. That is why we're sort of forced to have a distributed computing, uh, that what we're doing is kind of a language of distributed computing. So you can think about these rewrite rules for hypergraphs as sort of a minimal distributed computing language. We don't yet know the analog of kind of, um, uh, you know, in, in Wolfram language, what I, what I see myself as doing is kind of putting in all those computational primitives that make it convenient for us humans to think about things uh, computationally. We don't know what the right primitives yet are for thinking about things in the sort of distributed computation that is forced on us by physics. So for example, I mentioned very early in this, in this talk, the idea of sort of programming in a certain reference frame. I think that's going to be a big thing. I think that the, the notion of how we think about evaluation fronts and so on, where we think about uh, you know, a, a sort of breadth first recursion versus depth first recursion and so on, the generalization of that, it's going to be all about reference frames. Um, and it's going to be all about uh, kind of, um, uh, and we don't know what the analog of functional programming is, for example. I have some ideas about how that works um, in the context of, of this sort of very distributed environment. I mean, we have now the analog, I mean, uh, I've been looking recently actually at combinators um, as, a, as a model of, um, uh, uh, and, and how those work in the multi-way graph for combinators, all those kinds of things. A lot of interesting things to say there. Anyway, I've gone on far too long. Um, but uh, I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a oh I don't know it's a it's a it's a, a sort of up to the up to the day update about the thinking that we're doing about physics and distributed computing and um, the kind of emerging synthesis between these two different areas. So I should stop there and maybe if there are questions comments I would be happy to try and um, address them. Let's see now I have to figure out how to expand that window so that I can actually see something here. Uh, hold on one second. Let me see if I can do that. Um, okay. <clears throat>
All right, we got some questions here. How is the sense of difference thought about in terms of rule steps? Well, so distance in physical space um, is here. Let me go back. I can stop sharing my screen here, and then it's, it's all me. Um, let's see how I do this. Hold on one second. I've got to move my mouse around, stop sharing. OK. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, oh, whoops. Um, a question here, what do you think the idea of elements and relations applies also to other fields of science like natural language theory? Uh, okay, so so I've, I've worked a lot on, um, on natural language understanding. You know, you, you may know that Wolfram Alpha is what powers computational knowledge and things like Siri and Alexa and so on. We've, we do lots of natural language understanding and we've kind of built this big system for doing that. So I, I think I know a little bit about natural language understanding. Um, the how this relates to that, I don't know completely yet. The main thing that I've been interested in is meaning space. So you have a word and you have another word, and there's some sense in which their meanings are some distance apart. Um, and the question is, what is that space like, that space of, of meanings of words? And I don't know what that space is like. People think it's sort of a linear vector space, and it's not. It's something more complicated than that. I don't know whether what we're doing can inform that. I'll be interested to see. Um, I think that there are other areas of, of science. You know, one of the things that's been really interesting with cellular automata is they are a minimal model. Uh, they're a sort of minimal distributed computing model of lots of things. And, and so, for example, I used to collect um, physical file folds. Actually, they're right in this room that I'm doing this video conference from. Um, the uh, uh, sort of a file folders of um, um, of kind of the different cellular automaton rules, the first 256 of them. And literally, each rule got its applications in different areas. You know, rule 90, applicable to catalysis. Uh, rule 184, one that I thought was going to be completely boring, is the standard minimal model of road traffic flow now. So a sufficiently minimal model will end up being a good minimal model of lots of kinds of things. So for example, in the case of, of these, these uh, uh, elements and relations, uh, hypergraph rewriting systems, I suspect that there is a good minimal model of machine learning that can be made where you're looking at the ensemble of all possible, essentially a multi-way graph of the ensemble of all possible learning paths in a machine learning system. I also suspect that there's a minimal model of biological evolution, which has always been a difficult thing to make kind of a, a clean mathematical model of. I suspect there's a minimal model of that that can be made in terms of multi-way graphs as well. OK, there's a question here. How is the sense of distance can be thought of in terms of rule steps? So distance in physical space corresponds to uh, 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 connections in the spatial hypergraph. So the way we measure distance is by sending a photon and seeing how it propagates a certain distance. And the rule steps correspond to uh, th the propagation of that photon has to happen by a series of steps uh, occurring in the evolution of the spatial hypergraph. Uh, another question, Einstein equations. Um, uh, okay, so th remember, this is not a cellular automaton. A cellular automaton is a, is a grid of cells. Um, uh, uh, this is a, uh, a hypergraph. Uh, I mean, it's, it's in which the actual structure of the space is evolving all the time. So the question here is, does that give a cosmological constant? Um, the answer is that um, what we get is a model of, of space in which the vast majority of what's going on in space is associated with the maintenance of space. And only this tiny little piece on top is associated with the, the energy and matter that we think of as things like particles. So in traditional uh, physics, one of the big problems has been that in quantum field theory, in the universe, there's all these virtual particles that happen, the, you know, these, these particles that are produced and disappear and so on, virtual particles, they generate they should generate a huge energy density in the universe. And it's been hard to explain why the universe is not, why that doesn't cause a huge amount of gravity that curls the universe up into a tiny ball. Well, in our model, that doesn't happen because that process of making all these virtual, virtual particles and so on, that process is what creates space. So that's why the, and, and so that process of creating space is what leads to a, um, uh, that, that is the energy density in space, but it is actually also space itself. And so measuring the cosmological constant in our models is distinguishing what is purely the energy associated with the maintenance of space from what is energy that we consider to be part of the particle content of space. It's like in the Einstein equations, you can try, kind of trade off 
the left-hand side, are you new gravitational waves for the right-hand side, you know, what's really considered an matter and what's really considered gra just gravitational waves. Same thing for us. So, so once we know in more detail what the actual particle content of our models is and we have specific rules and so on, then we should be able to compute the cosmological constant, but we can't do that right now. We can start thinking about things like dark energy and so on. And in our models, one of the weird things that happens is the dimension of the universe is not fixed. So in the early universe, you can have a higher dimensional universe that only gradually kind of cools down to our three-dimensional universe. Okay, spatial hypergraph, let's see. Uh, ah, right, okay, good question. So the question is, um, to what extent, when we get the spatial hypergraph and it agrees with the Einstein equations, what are the conditions necessary to get that? Okay, so I kind of glossed over this issue. So the point is, so the specific, um, we don't know the specific underlying rule. We hope to do a big search for that. We don't know whether we'll find one that represents our universe that's a simple rule. We don't know that yet. That's a, that's a sort of betting against nature thing that we can't really answer. The big surprise to me was I thought we would need to know the underlying rule to be able to make connections with existing physics. Turns out that's not true. It, and, and if we did need that, we would be mired in computational irreducibility. Because when we apply that rule, we apply it, we apply it, we apply it, it's, it's the, the application of that rule is, is going to be something where there's computational irreducibility. And that means if we want to reproduce the universe where we can get the first 10 to the minus 1,000 seconds of the universe, but it's going to take us a huge amount of computational effort to move forward to get more parts of the universe, so to speak. So that's what we thought we were going to get stuck in was computational irreducibility. It turns out there are generic features of these rules that uh, represent sort of pockets of computational reducibility on top of this kind of bed of computational irreducibility. And it turns out that existing physics basically is the story of those pockets of reducibility. Relativity and quantum mechanics are the story of certain things you can say independent of the underlying rule. Now, it's somewhat similar to what happens in fluid mechanics, where the equations for fluid mechanics are independent of the detailed structure of the molecules that um, uh, exist in the fluid. And so that's, it's kind of the same thing that happens here. So the, um, uh, there's a large class of rules. The only things you need are causal invariance, computational irreducibility, which kind of comes pretty much for free with any of these non-trivial rules, um, and the statement that the universe is only finite dimensional, which is a sort of observational statement. If you've got those things, then the Einstein equations follow. Now, dotting the I's and crossing the T's of the mathematics is very difficult will take a long time. It hasn't really been done for molecular dynamics in 150 years. Um, and I think it's more difficult in this case. It's very interesting mathematics. It reveals kind of the need for a kind of generalization of calculus that goes beyond uh, integer dimensional manifolds and so on. But we don't have that stuff. So we can't dot the I's and cross the T's. But the, the picture at a physicist level of doing mathematics, um, we can say that, that uh, this derivation works for a large class of, of underlying rules. So you can ask, you ask, are there rules which don't lead to Einstein equations? Absolutely. There are rules that lead to a universe in which, which exponentially expands and in which no parts of it connect to each other. There are rules in which the universe, uh, the evolution of the universe simply terminates. Um, those are rules that one can call them normal forms if one was talking about term rewriting. One calls them space-like singularities if one's talking about general relativity. Those are rules in which time stops. Um, so there are, there are lots of rules where, and the, the, the time stopping is a, is a phenomenon. There are singularity theorems in general relativity, which are closely related to theorems that one can derive about term rewriting about singularities, although we don't know those connections as well as we might, might hope. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, so there's questions about brains and the mirroring of, the, of what happens in brains versus what's happening in the universe. So... I don't think, I mean, I mentioned that I think there might be a mathematical connection between our multi-way graphs and ensembles of machine learning systems. Um, I don't think that the, the details of what happens in brains, I mean, uh, th th there is some level in which there's commonality because they're both computational systems and there is ultimately a translation between them. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I don't yet see more direct connections there. Um, although we will probably know more when we actually can have a language for programming in the sort of distributed computing of um, uh, um, 
um, of of um, um, uh, of of these things. So, for example, even as we think about sort of these generalizations of blockchain, um, it's uh, that's already very revealing because as we start thinking about you know quantum money or something, it gets one much more personally engaged with quantum mechanics, so to speak. You know, when uh, it, for me, it's very helpful in terms of intuition to start sort of imagining that I live in a quantum world, so to speak, um, by really taking those things which were quantum mechanical phenomena and making them things which which exist in the kind of larger scale computational world. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, so, OK, so this question about um, reference frames and so on. So yes, and I, I kind of glossed over this, but but one of the big conclusions of the whole story of Lulil space is the story of the fact that the description language, that there are many different description languages for the universe. And in fact, that there are many vastly, completely incoherent descriptions of the universe. So we describe the universe in terms of space and time and particles and so on, but there could be completely, utterly different descriptions. So let me give you an example of a, a way in which our description of the universe is fairly specific to us. So we exist at a certain scale. We're small compared to galaxies. We're big compared to atoms. And for example, our when we look around in the world, uh, we we see a certain you know we we see things out to a certain distance. The speed of light is very fast for the distances that we're looking out to. Unless we're astronomers, the speed of light is very fast compared to our internal brain processing speed. So for us, it makes sense to slice time in such a way that we talk about simultaneity surfaces. We talk about things where things are happening everywhere in space at a particular time. If we, for example, had different physics by which we perceive things, you know, if we mostly, uh, if we mostly smelled the universe, if we were sensing, you know, uh, uh, molecules that are diffusing to our nose, so to speak, uh, that happens very slowly relative to our processing speed. And so we would have a very different view, uh, probably. We would have built up a different notion of sort of space and time than the one we have. So one of the things we realize is it's kind of a, an ultimate humility about kind of our place in the universe that, you know, I had always thought, you know, if we find the extraterrestrials, you know, the intelligent aliens, at least they have the same physics as us. But that's completely not true. In other words, and, and for example, this principle of computational equivalence kind of implies that there's lots of intelligence in the universe, but we're now realizing that its, quote, perception of physics can be utterly incoherent with our perception of physics. So in a sense, one can have a different view of what's going on in the universe, even though at, the, at some level it's, it's still the same, uh, same underlying framework that's, that's operating. Um, so I probably, let's see, I think we have one more question here. Um, okay, so there's questions about uh, experiments and so on. So, you know, we're at a stage of in terms of our theory of physics, we're at a stage which is common in, in sort of new paradigms for, for understanding things where we are making essentially theoretical predictions, where we're saying, given our theory, can we reproduce things which have already been understood from other theories? So, you know, there are a lot known in physics, you know, how angular momentum works, fermions and bosons, the properties of gauge invariance, things like this. The question now is, with our model, can we see that those things work the way that we have know that they work in physics? And the really exciting thing is that so far we're in a no kludges situation. We just, we investigate things and they really fall into place the way that they actually happen in physics, which is really exciting. It's not something where we say, oh gosh, in order for this to work, we have to explain why the universe isn't 10 dimensional or some such other thing. So, so that's kind of the stage we're at, but there are things we can start to say uh, one of the things that's holding us back is we don't know this maximum entanglement speed. If we knew that number, um, if we knew that accurately, we would be able to say, make quantitative predictions about things. I mean, in the case of general relativity, Einstein was lucky that one prediction he made about the bending of light around the sun, it was precisely a factor of two relative to the classical, the, the, the pre-existing theory. It was a scaleless prediction. If he'd had to talk about things with the cosmological constant, which adds a scale to general relativity, since one didn't know what that was, at the time, one couldn't have made those predictions. Now, we may have some scaleless predictions, possibly involving photons in orbit around black holes and the way that their quantum correlations work. We're not sure yet. Those may be some sort of scaleless predictions. 
um, that just arise from the interplay between branchial space and physical space. Not sure yet. Um, we'll probably know actually in the next couple of months, I hope, about that. But there are other predictions that do depend on the scale. If we're right about the 10 to the 5 solar masses per second, which I would be amazed if we're right about that, because the derivation of that is, is quite rickety um, and makes a bunch of assumptions. Um, and it, it implies that there's an elementary length of order 10 to the minus 101 meters. Um, uh, and um, the, um, uh, that, that's, um, uh, that determines, um, sorry, elementary length 10 to the minus 93 meters, elementary time 10, 10 to the minus 101 seconds. Um, the, uh, it's actually small compared to what people talk about in physics with Planck lengths and so on for, for various reasons one can explain. Um, the, uh, uh, but in any case, given that scale, we can then make predictions and we can say things like, in the merger of two black holes of a certain size, there will be effects associated with maximum entanglement speed uh, that will, uh, will inhibit the merger relative to what one would expect just from the speed of light, from speed of things in physical space. Um, but we're sort of just at the early days of, uh, and, and there are also things about the possible existence of these particles we call oligons, which are particles that involve a small number of edges in the in the uh, in the uh, spatial hypergraph that will have masses very small compared to the electron um, that possibly have something to do with dark matter that seems to be observed um, in the universe, but we don't know those things yet. But so that's um, uh, that's kind of a. a um, uh, coming attraction. I, I should say that one of the things in developing this theory, we actually have a, a summer school that we're doing about these things that's sort of an, uh, emerging from a 17 year long story of summer schools. And this year it's virtual and it starts, uh, week zero of it actually starts at the beginning of next week. Um, and there's a track of that um, uh, studying fundamental physics um, and uh, lots of physicists coming to that. Um, and hopefully one of the one of the things which will come out of that is a lot of explorations of the correspondence between what we've studied, our sort of low-level machine code of the universe, and a lot of mathematical physics that's been done at sort of higher levels about, about the universe. So that's... Dr. Wolfram, may I, may I ask you one question? I usually have a chance of question, but you had so many <laughs> questions from, from the audience. Uh, if it's just, just, if you have time for one question. Yeah. Uh, I'm puzzled with the with the relation of uh, something that I, I, I love mostly in, in theoretical physics, which is nether theorem, uh, connecting uh, symmetries with conservation laws. And right. I just wonder how could you connect it, because that requires infinitesimal uh, transformations in, in some sort of uh, continuous space. If you can transform it into your language of uh, right. groups, that your graphs might uh, have, uh, and then, then you will sort of regain uh, symmetries and then perhaps something will come out of that. Yeah, we, we, have, we have tried to understand this theorem in the context of our models. Um, actually, Jonathan Gorod has, a, has some kind of hypotheses about the relationship between uh, a thing called the Robertson-Seymour theorem um, that uh, has to do with the way that topological obstructions happen in graphs and know this theorem. Uh, don't completely know how that works yet. Uh, I mean, I can say something about um, uh, I say something about symmetry groups. So, for example, rotational invariance. How does rotational invariance work? Um, uh, one of the uh, and this is it's kind of complicated. So, so um, well, let me let me take another example. Let me take local gauge invariance. Um, the well, okay, rotational invariance is all about the large scale limit of the spatial hypergraph that on a large scale, the thing will act like Euclidean space uh, and be rotationally invariant. And one can see that in lots of examples. But understanding, uh, so for example, here's, a, here's an example of something that we don't yet have the mathematics to describe. That's all well and good if we're looking at a graph whose limit is an integer dimensional space. Then we can say it's just like Euclidean space on a small scale, it's got rotational invariance. Okay. Let's say it's like 2.7 dimensional space. Its limit isn't an integer dimensional space. What is the analog of rotational invariance in a non integer dimensional space? What's the analog of SO3, you know, the rotation group, SO2.7? What is SO2.7? So we're starting to understand what that might be, but the mathematics really isn't quite there yet to do that. Um, possibly some ideas from categ higher category theory might be relevant there. We're not quite sure yet, but I think this 
this theory is kind of driving the development of mathematics that would let you understand things like that. Now, when it comes to local gauge invariance, what is at issue there is, is there a local symmetry, uh, sort of internal symmetry to the system that, um, uh, and it turns out that when you apply these rewriting rules, any given rewriting rule has many ways that it can be applied. And when you look at sort of powers of an individual rewriting rule, so you look at the results of, uh, you know, n steps of rewriting, that's like a, a, a macro rule that, um, uh, that can be applied in certain ways. It turns out that the set of ways that it can be applied corresponds to a certain set of permutations in the spatial hypergraph. And so what one has is to say this rule can be applied, sort of doesn't care which of this whole bucket of permutations is applied to it. And so what ends up happening, I think, is you get these larger and larger, as you look at larger and larger kind of macro rules, you get this kind of larger and larger bucket of permutations that has more and more permutations in it. And the limit of that collection of permutations, I think, is going to be a Lie group. But the mechanism by which discrete things can limit to Lie groups is completely not understood. There is essentially no mathematical work that seems to speak to this. In fact, amusingly enough, there's actually one of the obscure papers of Alan Turing is precisely about the finite approximations to Lie groups. And his conclusion is you can't do it. There is no finite approximation to a Lie group. I don't think that's correct. Um, but this is an example of where we run into issues, sort of mathematical issues. But I think Noether's theorem is an interesting, uh, you know, there will be an analog of Noether's theorem, but to understand it, we need to understand more about how groups operate um, in, in these limits of discrete spaces. Um, we don't yet understand that, and it's a super interesting piece of mathematics. And I, you know, I'm hoping, uh, 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 I think there are some people already working on these things. I hope an increasing number of people will work on this. This is a non-trivial, it's a non-trivial thing to understand, but it's a, it's a really good question, um, you know, how that might work. And, um, uh, you know, we're working on it. Dr. Wolfram, thank you very much. It was, it was, it was really uh, fantastic to have you at uh, our seminar. Uh, of course, there are so many questions that, uh, that you sort of, uh, your lecture lead to. Uh, it's fascinating. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I thank you in my own, uh, on my own behalf and on behalf of uh, everybody else here uh, in the audience. Uh, so this uh, ends uh, our 10th uh, seminar, virtual seminar uh, in computer and computational science. Uh, as you see, we are trying to sort of uh, make, uh, make this uh, event uh, a forum for, for exchange of, of the most fascinating new ideas. Uh, in the spirit of, of the series of conference we've been running for, for, for the last six years, Supercomputing Frontier Zero, where we constantly strive to, to show things that, uh, that are being developed, that uh, the newest ideas, uh, the newest ways of uh, looking at, uh, as we see today, at the description of the universe, at our understanding of, the, of physics and universe, but also the process of computation, computers, uh, and uh, tie it to all the ways of uh, our understanding. Uh, next week, uh, we won't have a seminar. There's a conference, uh, ISC High Performance uh, International Supercomputing Conference, uh, which uh, traditionally took place in uh, uh, Germany. But this, uh, this time it will be virtual. So I invite you all uh, to this uh, very, very interesting event. During the summer, uh, we will have towards the end of our summer, uh, summer uh, August, September, we'll be running uh, workshops for, for students. They will be open uh, for, for smaller groups. And again, they will be uh, related to AI uh, computations and graph computations. We'll be having a workshop on SOL framework on our vector computer, uh, NEC or uh, Aurora. Uh, Tsubasa, we'll have Eureka XC on our Cray, uh, graph environment, and Trovaris. Uh, 
You can also check uh, our uh, Supercomputing Frontiers page where we released, uh, uh, we will be releasing uh, all the keynote uh, talks from this year's conference. Uh, the first uh, day uh, the keynote is already released. Uh, we'll have uh, in July, we'll, we'll release uh, the second uh, talk and uh, uh, in August, we'll have a lecture by uh, Professor Jim Czerzewski from UCLA. And finally, we, you have uh, lectures of all of our previous nine speakers. Plus, of course, uh, today's lectures, they will, will be all available uh, to see. Uh, they, they are being recorded, so you can uh, watch them at your, uh, at your leisure. And I, enc I encourage you to do, to do so. And uh, with this, uh, I'm saying goodbye and uh, let's see each other uh, in the autumn when we uh, renew our series. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.